Thank you, thank you. Um, it is true, academia can be so cutthroat, and so I feel totally prepared. I'm in my element um, in the academy, so uh, it does really make me wonder how people do this without having uh, been a trained assassin first. <laughs> So I'm going to talk to you today um, about where we are, where we're going, a lot about technology of the future, flight, cars, transportation systems. And it turns out that technology and flying has a lot to do with technology and other transportation domains. And I'm going to try to connect those dots for you today. You did hear that uh, I was one of the first female fighter pilots for the United States Navy. Uh, is there anybody, any retired Air Force people in the room? No? Oh, one. I see one hand. See, I, what I do is I like to take that person and pick on that person for the whole rest of the night. <laughs> and you're like, oh, thank God I didn't raise my hand. Um, but I like to say, yes, I've landed on aircraft carriers, and this is what makes me better than an Air Force person, for sure. <laughs> But it was while I was um, learning to land on aircraft carriers uh, that I really learned what the difference was between what a human can do and what a computer can do. And uh, in the early days when airplanes and fly-by-wire systems were just coming online, they were pretty sketchy, but engineers, you know, after enough accidents and uh, getting the problems ironed out, certainly by the mid-90s and definitely by today, uh, the automation always lands the plane better on the carrier than a human. The pilots actually just shadow the controls. They kind of hands, have their hands nearby just to kind of wait to make sure that everything um, happens, but the planes always, always do a better job at landing than a human pilot does. But what's worse is actually not the landing. What's worse is the takeoff, because when you go to takeoff, especially in the F-18 Hornet, you actually sit in the cockpit, it's a single seat cockpit, so you're by yourself, and you have to turn to one side of the carrier and show everyone that you're not touching anything, and you literally hold your hands up. <laughs> And then you turn and you show again, everyone, I'm not touching anything. And then you put your hands and you hold these bars to make sure that you're not touching anything before you take off. And the reason that they don't want you touching anything is because the computer's going to fly it. The computer always does a better job than you do. And if a person touches the controls, it sends a command to the computer and the computer has to try to evaluate what the human is thinking. And it can cause even that split second of a delay can cause problems, and since you're flying it very close to the stall margin up uh, off the front of the carrier, it can cause you to crash. So you're like a five-year-old as a fighter pilot in the plane. Do not touch anything. We do not want you touching anything. <laughs> and then it makes you wonder, well, if I'm not able to touch anything, and I can only do bad if I touch anything, and it's always landing itself better than I could, then why am I here? And so that was my time flying fighters was me realizing that there was something bigger happening, something more with automation. And um, I'm not really good at forecasting the future. You never want to invest in anything that I ever invest in because uh, that's a for sure not going to do well. But this is the one time that I actually was right, that I looked forward and I said, you know what? This is going to be bigger and better. It was also a time of social upheaval. And so I decided that after... Um, about not quite 10 years in the Navy, um, I decided that it was time for me to get out. I went back to school, got my PhD, and, and if you did not hear one word out of my, the one word you should have heard is human, right? Because I do, I am a roboticist, but my angle is very different from most roboticists in the sense that I'm the human advocate. I'm championing for the human whenever you see these complex robotic systems. That means I'm both championing the strengths of the human, but also understanding that we're all deeply flawed and tried to balance the design of systems to come up with the most effective joint system. And so the name of my lab at Duke is the Humans and Autonomy Laboratory. There is a joke in that name. Most everyone in this room should be old enough to get the joke. If you're under 40, I find that people under 40, and certainly my students, they're like, what? There's a joke in the name of our lab? Uh, if you're under 40 and you don't get the joke, you have to go ask someone over 40. 
All right, so, so you heard the name of the research that I do. It's called Human Supervisory Control. And what that really means, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It means that there's a human, and out here what you're seeing is a drone. The human is flying the drone, but they don't really fly it. What they do is they're sending commands to this computer, and the computer is figuring out what commands to actually send to the vehicle to make it do what theoretically the human is trying to get it to do. So that's drone flying, which I do a lot of research in, but it's the same that's happening. Um, that truck up there is a mining robot dump truck. If you look at the tire in the yellow shirt, you can see my student. That is a gigantic robotic dump truck. It is so well behaved, and the robot dump truck does not get into fights on Friday night and does not show up for work <laughs> drunk. I'm, I'm sure many of us in the transportation have seen, you know, these are problems that we have with humans. In fact, they're so well behaved, they actually started to have to program some uncertainty in how the tires were moving across the ground because the tires kept digging ruts in the same place over and over and over again. Rail, automated rail. Uh, this country, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, is embarrassingly bad about not having advanced rail. Most of the world, even third world countries, are, are way ahead of the United States in terms of automating rail. Um, drones, you, uh, those are the military drones, but commercial drones are really all the rage. This is a picture of a drone inspecting the Alaska oil pipeline. So this idea of using drones to inspect um, infrastructure, which I was telling somebody at the reception, um, yes, I'm from North Carolina, I am a refugee, thank you for providing me safe haven. Uh, but there's actually a swarm of drone pilots that are actually waiting on the fringes of Wilmington so that as soon as the hurricane passes, they're going to go in and start inspecting all the damage from the hurricane. In this particular case, I like to bring this example up of the Alaska oil pipeline, and, and I think people in Kansas will appreciate this in Missouri. So the problem with the Alaska oil pipeline is it needs to be inspected all the time because obviously we don't want any leaks, damage to the environment. But you know where the primary cause of leaks are coming from in the pipeline are bullet holes. People are in Alaska and the provinces that it goes through and they're shooting the Alaska oil pipeline. Why? When I tell this to my North Carolina crowd, they're like, why not? <laughs> exactly, that's exactly right. So I come from Tennessee. I could shoot a gun and make biscuits all before I was five. So I come from a gun culture. Uh, my family is going to be the first family to let an Amazon drone bring it a case of beer and then shoot it as soon as it drops the beer <laughs> off. So. You know, again, it's funny because I give this talk a lot and I go to the Northeast and people are like, in New York City, they're like, oh, no, people don't do that. Shoot things? Why would anybody shoot things? It's, it's pretty funny um, <laughs> to see the mystery on their faces. Uh, but commercial planes, every plane that you have ever flown in in the last 10 to 15 years has definitely been a highly automated plane. They all fly in this way that they're requesting that the computer actually intermediate between the task. And in fact, most airline pilots only touch the stick of any flight from three to seven minutes of any flight. Whether that flight is 18 hours or one hour, um, pilots only touch the stick. And the only reason that they're only touching the stick for three minutes is because the FAA hasn't certified takeoff yet. yet. Um, why do the airlines want, and they want the pilots to let the computer fly it, because when the computer flies the plane, the plane um, does a much better job at fuel efficiency, fuel consumption, and for each flight that a pilot does not touch the stick, thousands, tens of thousands of dollars will be saved in fuel cost, and every time the plane lands itself, it saves on the wear and tear of the tires, and a lot of people don't think about that. So when, when doing these complex control tasks, in most cases, um, we'll talk about not all, but most cases, the computers will do better. So um, I was one of the first researchers to get in drones. I had been in the military, obviously, you know, you know about my carrier background. Uh, my early research for my PhD was trying to get a handle on how humans could actually start to supervise drones in an effective way. And so um, I've actually been doing drone research since uh, actively since the year 2001. 
So that's a long time, 17 years. And I know people are like, wow, I, drones haven't been around for 17 years. Well, they've been around in some capacity in the military. Um, and then because I was one of the first researchers to get into drones, I kind of caught that wave early, which was really great for my career. I was the first research, the first person ever to hook a drone to an iPhone. Just shows how, and, and to this day, this iPhone app that I've got could control uh, a commercial passenger plane. It's really not, you know. Um, so that kind of put me on the map in terms of, you know, because once you get a, if something goes viral about you on YouTube, you know, then, then that's it. That's all you need for a life of fame. And so, so then um, I wrote this, well, but, but just to show you how, how funny this moment is, this I told you so moment, this picture comes from a paper that I wrote in about 2005, 2005, 2006, and I'm telling people that one day drones are going to do all of these things, communications, insertion means putting things into a place, like packages. Um, extraction and transport mean taking things out, including people, letting people be passengers on these things. And um, this is my baby, these are my baby years as a researcher, and I was repeatedly told to, that I should not do drone research, that it was just a toy, that this was never going anywhere. I would, th this, uh, I submitted this article to another institution, and they said, this is a niche market, no one's going to care about it, it's not going anywhere. Um, you know, good thing I stuck with it. Um, and then you heard about my viral YouTube moment. So then um, I started getting asked to be on TV shows. And then, of course, that's if you want to capture your students' uh, attention, this is um, what you're going to see. And I think we got the sound. Do I need to that, pause it? Is there a division of, of your office that works only on the perverted Oops. use? <laughs> Of, of, of that. <laughs> well, every technology can be perverted in some way, but I think one of the areas that people don't really think about when we talk about drones are what are going to be their commercial applications. For example, in five to ten years, I think you'll see FedEx, UPS, unmanned aircraft flying our packages around. I'm working on. Oh, the thank front. God! <laughs> I uh, I thought you were going in a different direction with what FedEx and UPS were. <laughs> FedEx, you, they won't ring on your doorbell anymore. Just boom. <laughs> Open window, here's your package, game! <laughs> um. So, Is there um, John, this was the January or February of 2013, and John Stewart's picking on me, um, trying to tell me what an idiot I am for this whole drone delivery thing. And then on my birthday in December of that year, um, you know, 10 months later, Jeff Bezos gave me the great, greatest birthday present when he publicly announced that they were doing the drone package. And we'd been working with groups like that for a while. So um, it was one of those times in my life where I, I, first of all, I got to say, aha, I told you so. And um, it really helped start to move this technology to the mainstream. Oops. And... Um, started to really propel me forward in my career. So I was very grateful um, for that opportunity. Uh, you can go you um, Google me, and I was on Colbert. And it's funny, I was also on 60 Minutes, but it's funny when you're, depending on what show you're on, you can actually figure out the demographic of who's watching what by who calls me after. Because everything's in reruns now. And it's always my friends who are under 40 will see me on Colbert and Daily Show. And everyone over 60 sees me on 60 Minutes. <laughs> OK, so. So one of my jobs as a researcher now that works in, I, I do mostly robotics and transportation, but I put my fingers in a lot of little pies. Um, so I have a secret formula for how I know if your job or my job is going to get taken over by a robot. And this is how I know about this. So I'm going to briefly, I'm going to go into a little professorial lecture, but hang in there with me. Uh, to understand whether or not a robot or a human is going to be able to do a job, you can break it down into these four levels. Does this task require skills, 
skill-based reasoning, rule-based reasoning, knowledge-based reasoning, or a very high level of expertise. And so let me explain what those are. Skills are highly automated tasks that you have to learn theoretically through a lot of repetition and a lot of training. So when a pilot goes to flight school in the military, you're there for two years to be a jet pilot, you're really just learning to make, you know, houses get smaller, houses get bigger, how to keep it in level flight, right? <laughs> Then, once you learn that, and by the way, almost every highly trained pilot can move from one cockpit to another. They may not be the smoothest pilot, but they instantly understand what's going on in the cockpit and can interpret the gauges and probably at least get the plane in balanced flight. Once you free up cognitive resources from having to learn to read the gauges and interpret, then you can use your brain to do rule-based reasoning. I can follow procedures. I recognize that I might have this uh, warning light in the cockpit. I need to reason through what to do about it. I follow a procedure. I solve the problem. But then, and then what you're seeing is that we're going up this curve because this curve, the arrow is getting bigger to show you that there's uncertainty in the world and at what level you need what reasoning. So when there's little uncertainty in the world, skill-based reasoning does fine. Rule-based reasoning helps you cope with a little bit more uncertainty. But when you get to the, uh, the fatter part of the arrow, a lot of uncertainty, now you have to start doing something we call knowledge-based reasoning. And this is when you have problems and there's not an exact way to figure this out, right? So. Uh, and I like to use the miracle on the Hudson as a good example for this because, you know what? Engine flameouts because of bird strikes. We know what to do about that. There's a procedure in a manual to do with that. Um, usually it's just one engine, though, that, gets suck that sucks birds in. And one engine is usually working. Dual engine flameout, we've got a procedure for that. Um, you can set it up as a glider. Uh, dual engine, flame out, over water, not sure you can, uh, not sure, oh, lots of uncertainty, right? Can I make it? Can I not make it? Am I going to get a relight? Am I not going to get a relight? So now what you're doing is you're having to make a lot of guesses, and Chesley Sullenberger was having to make a lot of guesses about the way he thought things were going to go. So he's running fast simulations in his head, and this is actually what makes him now the expert over all every other pilot. So I... I know he's about 20, 25,000 flight hours. Um, had I stayed in the military, I would be just getting up to that at this place in my career. Uh, a pilot who has 20,000 flight hours that never had a ma massive emergency is not as much of an expert as someone who has, right? Because that person has to, what we call reason out of the box, really go into the critical thinking, learn how to adapt on the fly, particularly in fast, um, uh, critical time critical situations. And it's that, un that expertise that has to happen under massive uncertainty. That's really why you need humans. Really, the break point between automation, robots, and humans really sits at but the rules to knowledge, right? So if your job is all about skills and rules, then your job can probably be automated. If your job is about knowledge and expertise, then you're pretty solid. I have to tell you, as a professor, I am sitting way fat happy up there. Yeah. <laughs> and you only get better as you get older, right? So I'm, I'm good. I've got my job. Um, but what about pilots of the future? Well, right now, there are pilots needed really because we have not quite got the engineering to solve the uncertainty problem, but we will. And we will a lot faster than we will for cars. And we'll talk a little bit about that. In, in five to 10 years, you will start to see drones that are Fed, uh, FedEx drones, DHL drones, UPS drones. Com cargo market, by the end of my lifetime, will be almost all drones because planes can do it better and we're, gonna, we're working on solving some of these problems. There probably won't ever be a commercial passenger drone, uh, mostly because you need a captain on the flight to control drunk passengers, drunk and unruly passengers, right? It's like the Captain Kirk of the future is going to be dealing with the people who can't be nice to each other in the window and aisle seats, right? So, um, so but that's something we need to think about in the future because when you're starting to turn into a service-based economy, which we are, 
uh, and we're turning some of the dull, dirty, dangerous work over to drones and robots, which we're going to be doing more of, then that doesn't necessarily take a job away, it just redefines a job. But let's talk about what that means then in terms of just generally transportation. Well, if we think about these three major forms of transportation, what happens is you can think of trains as skill-based reasoning. Doesn't take a lot of brain power, they're on a track. There's not a lot of uncertainty. In theory, you know where they should be unless they've derailed, right? And so um, we actually, it doesn't take a lot to train somebody. In fact, we can automate trains and in various parts of the world they are automated. Who can tell me why aren't we automating trains in this country to a much higher degree? Unions, it's not even just the unions though, it's also the companies who don't necessarily want to put the cash outlay um, to actually put all the sensors and the tracks and the infrastructure. This, that's a whole other argument that we could have later. Um, the companies are not really thinking very far into the future. Um, surprisingly, people, that they, they think the, ne the next complicated one are drones. They're like, oh, that's so much harder, right? You've got altitude, a whole third axis. Why isn't flying planes so much harder than um, automating cars? And that's because, first of all, there's not 50 other idiots in the plane just inches from you in their own plane while they're putting on makeup and texting and hitting the kids in the back seat. Eat, right? So, you know, they, we, we have this, the third dimension actually reduces the uncertainty because it gives us a bigger volume to keep control of, to keep you safe in. And we actually, um, drones are a really mature market. The first drones were flown, uh, military drones were flown by DARPA in 1990. So they've been around a long time. Planes land themselves quite well, take off quite well. We know how to do this and, we, and we've done it for a long time. So we've got a fairly mature technology coming to drones. And, and they really sit between the rules and knowledge base elements. Driverless cars are a completely different animal. And that's because there are 50 other idiots, right? Just, you know, and you, today, coming from Kansas City, what up with you drivers? Somebody hiaka four lanes over into, I'm like, are we in Boston? Like, where did that come from? Like, <laughs> I, it's been a while since I've been at Kansas City, but I was really glad you've grown so much. You've got, you know, underscore bolded letter drivers uh, who, <laughs> That's how you know you're really up and coming when you want to kill, you got road rage going on out there. So, but that's actually the problem, is that we've got people behaving in highly variable, highly uncertain ways. And if that's, if, how are we going to get a computer to actually start to understand what all, it's bad enough that you have one crazy driver, but then you have a lot of different crazy drivers, and this is not a mature field. And I'm going to show you some pictures um, a little bit later to explain to you just how not mature this field is. All right, but first, I want to come back to the human and talk about, remember I told you before that um, you need to understand what humans are really good at and what they're really bad at to understand what's the right balance of humans and automation. So this is a curve, it's called the yerkes dotson curve, and what it represents is something that is very intuitive to all of you. Your best performance on the y-axis is really somewhere in the middle. If you're worked too much, then you drop things. I'm a single mother, believe me, my workload level is always high. The fact that I get out of the door with my pants on in the morning is a miracle, right? But on the other side, it's actually equally as bad. Boredom and complacency is just as bad as trying to push people too hard. Your brain actually seeks simulation. Stimulation. Your brain wants something to do. I know a lot of you wives are looking at your husband where you are like, are you hearing me? Are you listening to me? Yeah, trust me, the reason he's not hearing you is because he is bored or something else in his head, and he's gone somewhere else in his head. Teenagers do it too. My students do it in spades. Uh, you know, they go somewhere else in their head to get the stimulation that their brain is driving them for, right? So this is a problem uh, in automated systems because we automate typically to pull people's workload back. But then what happens, most of the time, we shift it way over to the left. Anybody remember the two Northwest pilots that were on their laptops when they got lost over Minneapolis? They were bored to tears, and they were actually both sleeping. 
Because that's the other problem is like when you're responsible for monitoring these highly automated environments, um, sleeping is a problem. It happens a lot in nuclear powers and other advanced refinery control. You know, trying to keep people awake while they're babysitting an automated system can be a real problem. There's another problem that we have when we start to automate systems, and this is called mode confusion. When we start to introduce a lot more automation into a system, this, it actually can become a lot harder for people to understand what is actually going on under the hood because it's all computer-based. Flight school 20 years ago is not the same as flight school today in terms of learning the systems and how the systems work, particularly when something goes wrong. So there was a study done where 2737 pilots were, and these are all people that had anywhere from 5,000 to 15,000 flight hours, were asked to name the three ways to turn off the automated diseng um, approach mode, to disengage the approach mode, the automated landing. So I, b before we get into this, just remember aviation is still the safest way to travel. <laughs> You're in good hands. But unfortunately, seven of those 20, couldn't name any of the three. Uh, you know, only three knew all three, uh, and 14 named a way that didn't even exist. <laughs> These people are responsible for your life, right? And you're like, huh. And, but this is such a well, and it's very well studied, very well known that cause and effect, we start to associate their thinking that because they turned the yoke in a particular way, that caused it to disengage, as opposed to it was actually some other trigger somewhere inside the system that did it. And so this is a real problem with humans because we don't, even people who are highly trained, even people that have to go through an annual check ride, do not fundamentally understand the logic that underpins complicated aut automated systems. That brings me to my favorite automated system today, the Tesla. Who here is driving a Tesla? Okay, I see one, maybe two. Okay, did your wife give you that Tesla? <laughs> no, because I tell women, and men, but frankly, ladies, let's be real, only men are buying these cars. If you want to get rid of your husband legally, just buy him a Tesla and tell him to put it on autopilot. Now, now why do I say that? Because we already know, we've seen it multiple times that Tesla is a driver assist system, and you, sir, are probably an excellent driver, and you pay attention perfectly, and you do exactly what you're supposed to. You never take your eyes off the road, and you never take your hands off the steering wheel. That's what Tesla wants you to do. Unfortunately, that's not what people really do. Um, Tesla asked me to come out and give a talk last year, and they were shocked be because they were shocked and appalled that people were putting the car on autopilot and then jumping over and getting in the back seat and making a YouTube video out of it and then making a go viral, right? Uh, let me tell you, I've seen it all. Humans can do really stupid things with technology. Uh, but be beyond the obviously stupid things, the Tesla in autopilot has for sure killed three people. It's been implicated in other accidents. And in all of these cases, the humans did not understand the mode that the system was operating in, did not understand that the systems could not see, for example, static objects on the highway. This is the big killer, is that people will go down the highway, and in one case, it was a parked street sweeper. Another, it was a lane divider. Um, the way that these radars work in the car, they can't can't see static objects at high speed, which is when people are mostly using these vehicles. And so the cars will ram these static objects at 75 miles an hour, which you are not going to survive. So that's a problem. And it's a problem as we start to go forward that we really, we know it very well. And I'm, I've actually, I'm in the knickers of all the car companies constantly. Uh, it's always amazing. I'm always surprised I don't see little red dots of like tracer bullets coming after me because I, but I'm nagging at them all the time that they need to look more at aviation for the lessons learned for mode confusions to start to apply those to driving because the more automated cars get, the more we're going to see people confused by what they're doing. Now, that's assuming that um, if, if you've got the human all taken care of, let's just talk about some of the limitations of computers themselves. So computer vision has come a long way. It has been transformative. It's going to be continue to be transformative 
in places like medicine, radiology, detecting cancer, lots of exciting stuff going on there. But in the transportation world, still we're kind of struggling to make these things work all the time like they should work. So this is a picture of a typical computer vision system. Uh, there's multiple car companies out there uh, who are doing driverless car technology. They all have this problem. It is the problem of bottoms up versus top down reasoning. So in this picture, the computer vision system sees two cars, three bicycles, and only one person on the bicycle, which is kind of funny. It, it can't even associate, it thinks there are two driverless bikes somewhere out there, right? But you see that, and you're like, wait a minute, that's just two cars, right? That's because the human brain is very efficient at inductive reasoning. You see the big picture and can you ab immediately abstract out the individual pixels that don't matter, right? You understand instantly, as would a two-year-old, that that is just a picture on the back of the car, and so that picture is not real. And as a driver, you wouldn't even spend time looking at that picture. You would just see two cars and keep going. But Computer vision systems reason at, a very, reason at a very granular level. They put the pixels together, and then the pixels make the thing. So that's why we call it bottoms up, as opposed to you that are thinking top down. And we simply don't understand necessarily how to imbue inductive reasoning into computers, uh, computer vision today. So we've still got a long way to go um, to make this um, successful, which is why um, I'm very emphatic that driverless cars should only be in experimental settings right now. <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> that's what they gave me water for. <clears throat> because if we don't really understand <clears throat> how to make the computers reason at least more inductively, then we're going to continue to have problems like the pedestrian that was killed in Tempe, Arizona that was hit because the car didn't see her. All right, so let's talk about the future, though. That's, that's where we are today. So what's going on in the future? Well, you've already heard me talk about that arrow that gets fat. The, uh, the whole thing that you need to do then is figure out how to match the technology and the human on that curve, who needs, who needs to be dealing with what uncertainty, and where can we put the automation. So Amazon, who loves to order Amazon uh, shipping at 2 AM? Uh, I am the biggest shopper. I will wake up in the middle of the night and think, oh my God, I have a birthday present for my daughter's mom. And immediately, and it's there in 48 hours or less, right? So I love, love, love Amazon. Um, and how it works, how they actually do it is, this is a company called Kiva that I worked for when it was before. I, I should have bought stock in this company. I was working with them before Amazon bought them. I, this, I could just shoot myself. Um, they have these little robots, these orange robots, and so when you click that button that I need to order a set of these vitamins uh, and have it ship Amazon Prime, and you get it, and like you order it, and two hours later you've actually seen that it's been shipped. You're like, how does that happen? These little robots get your order. They race around this warehouse. This You can see the sea of uh, black carts. They actually go underneath it, pick it up on their backs, and they run over to a picking station. So in this huge warehouse, there's only a handful of people, and it will actually rotate the bins and tell the person where to pick it from. So a person picks your vitamins up and then drops it in that box. Maybe sometimes they're smart and they go get the multiple things and they bring it to them all. Then that's how they all, you know, have you, have you ever gotten like weird things all together in one box, but yet there was one separate of, of the, all those items? That's how it happens. And so then the human throws it in the box, then it goes through an automated ceiling and it's off, right? So it's almost all robots, but the one place that they need the human is to pick it. And you would actually say, well, why is it, that's not very high in uncertainty. Why is a human there? And that is because technically this thing that you've got at the end of your arms is also the hardest thing to replicate. This is the holy grail of robots. These are why you are not gonna get Rosie the robot made anytime soon. <laughs> Right, because these are amazing. These can articulate, and they're also amazing because they're hooked to your brain, and your brain has that ability to do inductive reasoning. So it's going to be a while. I'm not saying we won't ever get there, but for now, we're still really struggling with how to replicate the human hand. 
But that takes me to you know, something that I've been asked a lot tonight about, flying cars, right? So flying cars, you know, actually they're about equivalent on the uncertainty spectrum. If you've got $300,000, you can buy yourself a flying car right now. They ain't no big thing about flying cars. Uh, they exist. If you're rich, you can have one, as long as you have an experimental sport pilot license. You know, if, 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 but I mean, they exist. So the technology for flying cars is actually a, a no-brainer. We know how to do it. Um, there's a couple of other problems, though, with flying cars. Uh, so number one is, what do you think the FAA thinks about flying cars? <laughs> They're like, we did not get to be the safest form of transportation in the history of the world by just letting every Tom, Dick, and Harry just put, let them put themselves in a drone and fly around, right? Uh, you know, the people who are shooting uh, the Alaska oil pipeline would also be the same person that would get into the drone and start messing with it, right? So it's also this human interaction component, like how are we going to make sure that humans don't um, engage in buffoonery in the cockpit by themselves um, so that they don't bring the plane down. So there's that problem. There's also the larger infrastructure problem of communications. They don't, radars, uh, these planes are going to fly low. They're not really in the radar system as it exists today. People are looking at how we could use cell phone networks then to do um, tra air traffic control. But these things take time. So will you have flying cars one day? One day you will. But you're not going to get a flying car that you can order on uh, your Uber app on your phone like Uber wants to, you to believe that, they, that you can do. That's 20 to 30 years away at best in terms of service for everyone. Now, we may see a few experimental um, markets open, not really markets, and, uh, but there, it, this, we are nowhere near uh, being able to put these in true development, and that's really because of the larger infrastructure system. So you've heard me talk a lot about the collaboration, you know, and I, I want to bring this back to what is so, so important, I think, about the future is, you know, yes, we're going to get flying cars one day, um, and yes, driverless cars, even though they're deeply flawed right now, yes, we will get them. But one of the things I worry about is people spend so much time worried about the actual replacement of humans. I need to just get the humans out of the way as opposed to having the humans and the robots or the AI, for example, work together. And so this is a great example of how I see the future coming for um, in aviation and robots. This is a project done by Aurora Flight Sciences, um, a company I work with who was just recently bought by Boeing. Uh, this is, this, the name of this robot is Alias, and it's a robot that sits in the right seat. It is a robot meant to sit in the right seat, and you can actually pick the robot up out of the right seat of one, which is the caravan, and move it into another one. It could be a 737, could be a 787. The idea of this robot is, the robot is the pilot's assistant to help the pilot on those two ends of the curve. So the pilot gets to do all the flying that he or she wants, but you know, I mean, it's boring at en route, and boy, wouldn't I love a cup of coffee. And this is voice activated, so the pilot can actually say to Alias, hey, Alias, almost like Alexa, right? Uh, I need you to take control, take the yoke. I'm gonna go back and get a cup of coffee. Alias, the arm comes around, and it doesn't replicate the hand, but it replicates enough of the hand. It can grip the controller, and it actually can flip switches, and it can actually turn dials. So it's got some limited capability, just enough to be the assistant to the pilot. Consequently, if uh, the pilot was in a thunderstorm and everything is going to hell in a handbasket, the pilot could then also tell Alias, take control, descend and maintain, almost like an air traffic controller, while I get the charts out or I figure I look at this and I dial in, I do the flight management system maintenance so that I can make sure we get the aircraft all set up to go into this very high workload environment. So that's really where I see the future going, learning how to design these 
collaborative systems that really leverage the best of what both have. The pilots still can actually, it, we need the Chesley Sullenbergers of the world right now, especially to reason under those high areas of uncertainty. And we need the um, robots to help us pick up that dull, dirty, dangerous workload. But in driverless cars, there is actually something coming that, that's pretty close to that, that, that I, when I say driverless cars are bad, I really only mean if you're going to get into the back seat of your car. Um, don't do that in the Tesla. Or if you do, send me the YouTube video then so I can tweet it out and, and call you out on it. Uh, this is actually called the traffic jam pilot. So Audi has just introduced in Germany, not in the United States, this is a driverless car feature that only works between zero and 37 miles per hour. And it is specifically only to be engaged when you're in a traffic jam that's crawling at these slow speeds. Now, I wasn't in a traffic jam today. Um, I suspect that you must have them occasionally now that you've got crazy drivers on the road. Um, so I, but you know, any of us who've been in big cities, right, you can get in those traffic jams and even on the interstate when there's been a crash or something where the traffic is just painstakingly slow. You hate it. Uh, this is when you get extra bored um, and you really start to steam and fume because you're going to be late or you don't, can't get this done, can't get that done. So in this feature, which is starting to be rolled out, and you see him, the driver is watching TV. And in fact, the TV will be enabled during these slow crawl modes. In the traffic jam pilot, you are expected to not take control. You do not have to look. You do not have to have your hands on the steering wheel. In theory, you could sleep, uh, but it's gonna, when it gets to 37 miles an hour, then if you don't take control, then it would stop until, until you actually did something with it. So I think that this is a great collaborative environment because it is the time where you are likely the maddest, the most unhappy, seeking stimulation in your brain, the traffic is driving you crazy, it actually will lower your blood pressure if you have something else to do, you can text, you can watch TV, you can make all the phone calls you want. And so we, I see this as a, good, a great blending of, look, let the technology do what it needs to do. We also know that fatalities in and outside the aircraft, uh, aircraft, the car, go way down at slow speeds. These are not at highway speeds. And so by keeping this as a mode that works in slow speeds, then you really lower the risk and you also lower the uncertainty. One of the problems that driverless cars have in today's world are that they have to compute solutions at 75 miles an hour, they have to compute them so much more fast than they do at 37 miles an hour. And it's hard. And we, you know, even though Moore's Law has really kicked in chip performance, we're still not there yet because the solution spaces are so large, right? So slowing everything down really helps the computer um, do a much better job. And what about the future? I think the future is really interesting when we start to think about where we're going to go uh, in this technology. If you start to think long term, let's say the driverless cars do come along, we finally get driverless trains, some kind of drone market starts to come on board. If you're if you really want to know where to invest your money, you want to know what companies to start, it should be robot maintenance. This is an example of a, of a robot forklift. So these are really super popular in uh, manufacturing companies across the world. Uh, and invariably, I get called in as a consultant because what happens is all these end up in a closet because they break. And it takes a PhD in robotics to either reprogram them, uh, either just the software themselves or to figure out the software hardware interface. And so one of the problems, and this, exists, this problem exists now. So even robots that we have that exist now, we do not have enough people to maintain them, either superficial maintenance or even long-term troubleshooting problem maintenance. You don't have a call center in India that you're calling for your robot uh, uh, that's the forklift that's stuck. And I can only imagine, you know, if we, even if we could get driverless cars tomorrow and they just showed up in the road in the thousands, 
in a month, they would be broken and software. Last night, Elon Musk sent out a Tesla over there software upgrade that um, made the autopilot work, not work in something like half the cars, right? So now you've got software, you know, problems that you've got to address. So I think that, and you know, and Kansas City, Kansas, Missouri, the uh, universities actually in both states um, would be well posed to start looking into how do we think about maintenance? How is this gonna come around? What is aircraft maintenance gonna look like if we have electrical, electric vehicle, vehicle propulsion in addition to all this fancy control technology? So I come out to um, uh, areas like this and say, look, you've got great community college systems, great universities that are already looking at this and try to really motivate people. This is something that communities like this can really get behind and make a difference because no one's doing it and it's gonna be a problem. Another area is this idea of remote command centers. So this is actually a remote command center of a highway overlooking just man vehicles, a turnpike. But what's gonna happen is uh, as driverless cars start to come online, and even the driverless cars like the Audis, you're gonna have to start having a lot of this remote supervision. So now what we're gonna need in the future is one of these kind of like super OnStar places, right? It's not just OnStar that you're gonna call when you have had a crash, but what happens when your car has that over-the-air software upgrade and just kind of blurps in the middle of the, and that's gonna happen, right? What are you gonna do? How are you gonna get the car off the road? Steering wheels will one day disappear from cars. Steering wheels, brake pedals, and accelerators. Well, how, what's gonna, when the car breaks and the software doesn't work, what are you gonna do about that? How are you gonna get out of the way and, and get to a safe spot? So there's a lot of excitement in these areas. I think this is one of those infrastructure problems that I was talking about with driverless cars. And I think the thing going forward that people you know, who are really interested in looking to the future and what should we be thinking about is the infrastructure for these systems especially something like flying cars, that's really where the problems are. And so I think, um, I, and uh, Eric told me you guys are gonna hear from a flying car guys and soon, look, the vehicle's not the hard part. The hard part is the air traffic control. The hard part is the maintenance. Like, so that's really where I think the importance of put, you know, put your eggs in that basket, go to maintenance, go to infrastructure development, and then you'll be rich one day. All right, with that, I'll take some questions. We are videotaping and live streaming tonight's talk, so I want to come by with a microphone to get the audio of your questions. Uh, just raise your hands, and I'll stop by. Let me start up front. Oh, thank you. Okay. My question is, how does the car or the computer, what are the decision-making algorithms that make the car decide whether to save the driver or the passenger that walked in front of it? So this is a great question. It's being hotly debated right now. It's something we call the trolley problem. So the, the question is, if the car is a computer, and let's say you're the driver, and it, it, the car has to make a choice between whether or not to run you into a brick wall, the driver, or to take out the five school children that are crossing in the crosswalk. So we get this quite a bit. Um, I will tell you practically, uh, I don't even, I, don't, I spend zero time thinking about that problem because I, we can't even recognize those five kids, uh, the computer vision system, um, and it's actually very, very rare that you would be in a situation where it's just the wall or the kids, right? So it is, and, but, and this point of debate, in Europe they've actually said that all car companies will have to be, go public with their algorithm that does that. So in how does the car make the decisions it's going to make? And um, because this, it is a question of fairness, if you pay a lot of money for a Mercedes driverless car, it's probably gonna have a better algorithm than the Hyundai driverless car. That's a reality. And that, but, but the funny thing is when you pull that string, you have to say, but wait a minute, you already pay for superior safety features, right? 
I mean, you can spend all the money for a very expensive Volvo, or you can get the car with the lesser safety features. That's a choice that you make right now. So I'm not sure that, the, that, that that debate is that much different than the choices that we're making, but I will have news for you. Philosophers are more excited about this than any other group of people I've ever seen because, now, because they're actually getting research funding for it now. So, uh, so it's, it's, been, it's been good. Driverless car research is good for everybody. Yes, hi, Missy. Uh, it's so great to hear you speak. I have a question about alias and what happens when the airplane is struck by lightning. Does the computer, does alias disengage and allow the pilot to take over, or does it stay engaged and try and assist the pilot? Does so these are great. Sense? These are great questions because you know, I mean. Um, uh, lightning hitting, lightning hits planes all the time. You, it's possible you've been in a plane and been struck by lightning and you didn't even realize that. So um, there's actually been a lot of work into basically ruggedizing the aircraft to, and you're actually pretty safe uh, because the way, it's a metal cage that distributes the um, uh, electricity across the plane. That's not to say that you couldn't burn something out, but we're actually less worried about what happens to the robot as we would be to the entire flight control system. And this is part of the argument about should we or should we not have completely electric planes, right? So uh, that was a huge debate about 20 years ago when airlines wanted to go completely electric and quit having a hydraulic backup. So where are we today? Do you fly in all electric planes with no hydraulic backup? Yep, yeah, you do, right? That choice was made for you, but I'm telling you, it, that is actually, that choice was made because the engineering has gotten that much better, that aircraft are built to withstand lightning strikes and still have the ability uh, for the system's redundancy to, to come back online and give you the power you need. Missy, we have a question about, on your right. Yeah, I was curious about the, uh, the on the curves. You had the the rules, knowledge, expertise. So, what's what's the limitation? Is it more in the sensors that can't get all the information? For example, in the driving car, it can't see something static, or 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 is it in the actual algorithm itself that it doesn't know what to do with the information that it's getting? That's a great question. The um, we're limited at a couple of different levels. We're limited primarily for the sensors. This is where we say perception is the long pole in the tent. So having the systems perceive the world as it really is. So uh, LIDAR, for example, uh, which is theoretically a good sensor to do obstacle avoidance, when it, with just a little bit of mist in the air after like a foggy or just right after rain, that can actually destroy the LIDAR's picture, right? So there's still a lot of sensor limitations that we've got to get past. The algorithm limitations are a completely different problem and also uh, a serious problem. Algorithms, uh, especially you hear a lot about artificial intelligence and neural networks, these are still really new algorithms in terms of learning about the world around them and they actually, they're very brittle. So a neural net can be trained to see a stop sign, but a stop sign with a half an inch of snow on it will not be recognized by a car that was trained on stop sign, on just regular stop signs, right? But you could, I mean, you could extrapolate that to almost infinite conditions. Well, what about a quarter of an inch? Well, that looks very different than a half inch, right? So that's actually one of the reasons that engineering is gonna take a lot longer than people think. We will solve this problem, but right now we're still building a database and building our understanding of how they reason. And you, you can see probably a third of a stop sign and let's say that it was obscured in some other way or shot off by one of my family members with a shotgun. <laughs> You would know that it's a stop sign, but a car doesn't. And that's part of that deductive versus inductive reasoning problem. So I've, somebody else has a, uh, -huh. uh I was an engineer at Northrop and worked on JUCAS. So as a naval aviator, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the X-47B and how far away is that really coming uh, to reality. So the question is JUCAS, it was a Navy unmanned bomber fighter aircraft. Um, it hurts me deep in my heart because I was on the winning team for that and then the Air Force got rid of it, got the program wiped out, which means I lost about a million dollars worth of funding. So I'm really angry at the Air Force. 
that's another reason why I try to get in their knickers as much as I can. Um, so the JUCAS program was the right way of thinking, but I will tell you that that program got canceled. It wasn't just the Air Force's fault, although mostly was. Uh, <laughs> But it's also the Navy's fault. There is, in the military, the warfighter ethos is still one of humans at the tip of the spear. And I have to tell you, you know, I mean, I've been there. I, I know what it feels like to fly a fighter jet. And, you know, I mean, you are like God and you're amazing. And in fact, the whole military, particularly the Air Force, is all built to put the uh, fighter pilot at the top of the pedestal. And so, you know, we don't want to give that up. Humans don't want to give that up. And so the military, and I've written several articles about this, but the military is particularly bad at sabotaging drone programs uh, because they don't want the warrior ethos to change. And so, you know, we are seeing some change. I mean, the reality is humans are limited, you know, if, if this were, if I were talking to a group of kids, you know what the questions I'd be asked? How do you go to the bathroom? What do you eat? How do you sleep? You know what I'm saying? It's funny, but kids get to some of the most important questions right away. Yeah, you have to go to the bathroom. You have to sleep. You have to eat. That is exactly why humans are very limited. I, you can only take about eight Gs pulling against the force of gravity. If we actually had, I got into a fight with the Blue Angels a couple of weeks ago. Look, you know what the best air show is going to be? One that is completely robot because you will see eye-watering moves that are simply beyond human capability, right? So there are military people who are thinking these ways, but, you know, and I don't mean to be mean to guys, because uh, I'm part guy, you know, I mean. <laughs> But the reality is, I think that it is, you know, having been there, it's hard to give that up, that we are the coolest, we're the best of the best, right? Top Gun 2 is coming out, by the way. Did you know that? Coming out. Yes. Coming out. Uh, can't wait. Uh, um, there's a drone in there. That's all, all I can tell you. Uh, so, yeah, best of the best, and we don't want to let it go. But this was also a problem at the turn of the century with the horse and buggy. Right. I, I, he's like, gonna, you, I'm sorry. For those who are raising your hand, I have no control over this. This is all Eric's fault. <laughs> I'd like to hear your uh, views on the uh, pilot, autopilot uh, interface paradigm with the uh, Airbus, industry, Airbus company mm -hmm. and Boeing company, which is very different, and uh, the issues that have been there. So it's a great question, and this is a very savvy crowd. So for a long time, there was this, the Airbus culture, which was considered the engineer's culture, and the Boeing culture, which was considered the pilot's culture. And in theory, Boeing was designing planes to be flown by real men, and Airbus was designing planes to be flown by nerds. Okay, that, you know, I, I'm generalizing roughly, but that's generally what happens. I will tell you this, um, I've held a chaired position by Boeing, I've worked extensively and still do with Boeing, um, and I don't work with Airbus, because uh, they annoy me, the French, they drive me crazy! Uh, <laughs> Boeing is, has shifted and is more like Airbus than you could ever possibly imagine. So I, you may not want to hear it, but that's the reality. But that, the reality is, because Boeing realizes they've seen my human supervisory control slides. They've heard these talks. They know what's happening. They know that the future is drone. The next, they are building a flying car right now that takes the pilot out of the seat, right? That is what Boeing is doing. And, and I think they're doing the right thing, right? It is just the horse and buggy, you know, we could have this argument too. The reality is that the planes are going to be flown more and more by the computer and humans are really going to be the Captain Kirks of, of that environment. And so that's where we're going. It's the 787 is just like an Airbus. I know, you don't, I, but the funny thing, you have to remember, I'm an old guy too, you know. I mean, I remember, I'm really, I flew an A4 first before I flew the F-18s, which is a real man's aircraft and has no automation in it. Yeah, you know, I, I feel good about that. I'm like the Forrest Gump of aviation. Uh, but uh, as a mom now of an 11-year-old and also knowing all the really stupid, 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 dangerous things I did as a pilot just to show off. 
it's a miracle that I'm still here, you know? So I'm all for getting that human out because in the, in the end, it will be a better system when it's flown by a computer. As to the humanitarian spear, you were talking about the other spear, the drone's mission is to deliver a transplant organ. We're gonna go from Columbia, Missouri to Wichita, Kansas. We're in the Midwest. We have God's gift of incredible thunderstorms, not hurricanes, thank God, okay? So your drone, the flight service station says, you've got a front coming through, can't go. Is your drone gonna be able to take off, head to Wichita, divert to Oklahoma, divert to Nebraska, maybe land at an uncontrolled airport, right? And then look out with its sensors and see, oh, the front's passed, we have a clear sky, let's go to Wichita, deliver that transplant organ, and remember these are very short time envelopes. So what is your comment on that? Yes, that is possible. That is possible. Uh, yes, yes, that is going to happen. Yes, people are working on it. Uh, but, but it's important to remember, one of the things that I'm personally working on in that equation is developing what we call super dispatchers. So you think about air traffic controllers, they're still going to manage the skies, but dispatchers of aircraft today, who I think are truly the unsung heroes of aviation, um, they are actually going to be given a lot more responsibility because they are then going to be the PICs of these aircraft. So there will be a super dispatcher that sits in the command center, say in Dallas, uh, who's not even, you know, and it will be their job to collect information, to talk to people at the, people at the FBO, talk to get, get all that information. So it's very much going to be one of teamwork. So that drone will be doing all of those things, but not by itself. It's going to be helped by the, one of these super dispatchers. And this is another growth area um, that I'm working very hard on now, is growing the, this appreciation that dispatchers of the future ha will actually be the pilots of today. All right, due to the time, let's do two more questions. I know, Mark, you have a question over there. Let's go here about midway back in the room. Hey, this is uh, regarding the robot hand thing that you said we're so far from. Um, I, I guess on Facebook and other social media, um, robot hands are replacing people's arms that they've lost. Why are we so far away from uh, actually achieving robotic hands that can uh, you know, mm -hmm. do things like we do? So there's a difference between a robotic arm and a robotic hand, first of all. Um, and, it, and it really has to do with the degrees of freedom that you can articulate from your shoulder to your elbow to each joint of your fingers and, and that thumb, right? So we are, just like the alias robot, we are very good at developing like hand-like devices that can do a few things very well. Flipping a switch, there is a robot who is taught it can fold a towel in about four minutes. It's very slow, very slow. I actually use this video in my boredom studies. Watch the robot fold the towel. Um, but it's still, it's just that, right? So, so the problem is we have to be all robotic arms and hands are designed right now with very specific functionality and they don't have the general abstraction. I mean, if you think about it, I want you to study your own hands and arms for the next day and think about, oh my God, look at all these things that I can do. I catch things, I communicate with these, I do all of these things with my hands, and, um, and, and it requires almost no thought, no energy, and that's one of the other ones. The energy that it takes computers, the computation that they have to go through for the towel folding, why does it take four minutes to fold a towel? Because it's that much bits and bytes being shoved through a computer to do what something, again, that your two-year-old could do. All right, it, one more question. Yep, over here on your left. Um, there was an article late last year where Quartz um, talks about many more workers being displaced through automation than through outsourcing and that kind of thing, and then they project it forward. What are your thoughts on that? 
It's a great question. Um, I'm surprised it took you were the last person to ask that. Usually that comes up right away. So that's actually one of the reasons that I wanted to show you some pictures like, like this. So there's a lot of negative press. Um, I, I liken it to the hurricane. Oh my God, if I just came from North Carolina, you would have thought Chicken Little, you know, the sky was falling. Oh my God, you know, people are just going crazy. And the media just blows things so far. I mean, that's just the society that we live in. Every little thing has to just be blown up out of proportion without people standing by and saying, okay, look, it's a problem. Let's just deal with the problem. We, the media does that too with robots. Oh, you're all going to lose your jobs. AI is going to take over the planet and robots are going to be killing us all. <laughs> no, because honestly, all you have to do to trick a robot, like if a robot drone were to come after you, I'll tell you what first thing you need to do, just get some silly string. <laughs> That's enough to take a robot, a, a robot drone down, right? I mean, they're, they're such brittle systems. I know my, my 11-year-old with a broom can do a lot more damage to a drone than it could to us. And so, uh, you know, I think we need to be, just be reasonable about these things. And, and also, let's go back to the horse and buggy. Oh, my God. This, and, and it's hard for us because, of course, we didn't live at that time. But when the horse and buggy was about to be replaced by the car, the arguments were vehement, just as vehement as you hear all these arguments today. I mean, people thought the end of the world was coming because that you know motorized cart was coming around. And in the end, what did it do? It transformed us and entire new industries were built. And that's what's gonna happen with these trains. Yes, if you're a DHL or a UPS pilot, should you be worried? Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> But it's not going to happen overnight. You're not just going to be laid off tomorrow. Taxi cab drivers might have something to worry about in 20 years. And by the way, I just got back from Peru. <laughs> Driverless cars are not going to be there for a long, 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 <laughs> long, long, long time. Uh, uh, these people, they just get up and drive up on the sidewalk whenever they feel like it. I was like, all right, now deal with that uncertainty. Um, <laughs> So we are, you know, there will be some change, but it's not going to be fast change. It's not going to be wholesale change. And in the end, your iPhone, okay, maybe it did get rid of your home phone. A lot of you may be like me. I, I, I don't have a home phone anymore. By the way, 5G is going to get rid of all of your wireless. I can't wait to get rid of Time Warner cable, right? Um, but so it's going to change things. But, it, but new things will come. Maybe some bad things will come too. Cybersecurity, nobody wanted to get into those issues tonight. Yes, there could be some negatives to it. But on the whole, when technology comes, and if we can do it in a community spirit and get people engaged, and this is why I like to come and give these talks, to get you thinking about maintenance of the future. How are we going to address this through community colleges? How can we be a part of the future? That's the most important thing about that kind of change. All right, thank you, Dr. Cummings. Thank you. And thank you for attending tonight's program. Hope to see you back here at a future event. October 4th, Eric Lindbergh, the flying car guy, will be here, 7 p.m. Thank you and good night.